Hello, I'm Liz Jones, and welcome to Beejucation.com. Today's class will discuss three different options for creating clasps for your fused silver chains. If you've ever been bummed out by having to attach a pre-made clasp to your handmade chain, then this is the class for you. Today's class will be an intermediate level class, so make sure you have a little bit of fusing experience before we get started. Today we're going to talk about three different styles of clasps that you can use to finish off your handmade chains or other fused jewelry. The first and probably the easiest one that we're going to go over is a hook and eye clasp, which can be used for a multiple strand bracelet that you can either fuse chain to or string beads to. When this clasp is used as a bracelet, you do need to make sure that the bracelet is sized well, otherwise the clasp can work itself loose and come off. The next is going to be a textured toggle and we will discuss fusing the different shapes together and how to hammer this toggle so that it turns out nice and even and pretty. And lastly, a smooth toggle with a bar with bald ends. The pliers that we're going to be using today two pairs of chain nose pliers and these have smooth insides for gripping and manipulating metal without leaving marks in it. I'm also going to be using my very favorite Tronex razor flush cutters. What makes these cutters razor flush is just below my screw joint there is a small screw that sticks out between the handles and prevents the jaws of the cutter from overlapping when you pinch them closed. Because of the fine tips of these cutters, they do have limitations to the size of wire that you will be able to cut with them. I don't recommend using these on anything heavier than 14 gauge in fine silver only. In sterling, I don't go any heavier than about 20 gauge. Since we will be working with 12 gauge fine silver today, I also have an additional pair of cutters. These are Lindstrom flush cutters, and you can see the tips are a little bit more sturdy, so I'm not as afraid to use these on the heavier gauges of fine silver. The nice part about working with heavier gauges of wire is there are a lot more points on the surface that can be in contact, so the cut doesn't have to be as precise. I'm going to use a variety of mandrels today, the first being a stepped mandrel, and this actually has five different sizes that you can make rings around. I'm also going to use my standard favorite Sharpie and also a dry erase marker. I like to repurpose things around my house to work as mandrels. This way you don't invest in a set of mandrels and then lose one and you can't finish your project. We're also going to be using a two-hole metal punch. And this has two different sized bits that will punch through metal. The size that we're going to use today is a 1.6 millimeter bit and will accommodate up to a 14 gauge wire. I also have a bench block for hammering and flattening metal and a chasing hammer also used to hammer the metal. When I'm looking for a chasing hammer, one thing that I like to look for is a nice domed face to my chasing hammer. This makes it so that you can hammer on the wire and not leave marks from the edge of the hammer on the wire. One end is flat for hammering flat and then the other end has a ball for putting hammered texture in your metal. For your fusing station setup, one of the most important things that you want to have is a protective surface to do your fusing on. What I have here is a piece of stainless steel sheet. You can usually pick this up at your local hardware store. And this is actually here so if my torch should fall over or I drop any hot metal, it's going to protect the surface that I'm working on. This becomes extremely important if you fuse at your dining room table like I do at home. The next thing a fire brick or kiln brick and this is actually a brick that is normally used in the construction of kilns it is a thermal brick that retains heat and allows the metal to heat up enough to actually allow the metal to fuse this is a thermal brick so it stays pretty warm you will want to make sure that once you have pointed your torch at the surface of the brick that you don't use your fingers to touch it I can touch it right now because we have not used it yet to fuse but after you've pointed your torch at it it will stay warm for quite a while I also have a small handheld butane torch which we're actually going to use to fuse the metal. One thing that's really important about your torch to keep in mind is that the tip 
all of these metal parts on the front it's going to get very warm once the torch has been used so again I can touch it now because we haven't used the torch yet but you will just want to keep in mind that that's all going to stay pretty warm instead of using your fingers to grasp metal that's on your brick you'll probably want to use a pair of tweezers this will help you keep from burning your fingers and I also have a bowl filled with cold water so that we can quench our metal and then throw it into that water which will instantly bring it to a temperature that you can touch. Silver does not have to be quenched. You could let it sit in air cool, but who wants to wait around for that? So we have this bowl of water. You will want to make sure that when you quench your metal that you fully drop it into the water before you try to handle it. The materials that we will be working with today are all going to be fine silver wire. Fine silver is actually 99.9% .9 pure silver versus sterling which is 92.5% silver and then 7.5% another metal, usually copper. I have three different gauges of wire that we're going to be working with today. 14 gauge wire which we'll use to create our toggles and I have about 12 inches of that here. 12 gauge wire which is one step heavier and we'll actually use this to make our hook and eye clasp. And I have about 6 inches of that and then just a couple inches of 20 gauge fine silver wire which will also aid in the construction of our toggles. The first clasp that I'm going to demonstrate is going to be the hook and eye clasp. So I have my 12 gauge fine silver and the mandrels I'm going to use for this are a sharpie and a dry erase marker. The millimeter sizes for these mandrels are 12 and 18 millimeters. So the smaller mandrel is one third smaller than the large mandrel. So if you don't necessarily like the size of this clasp or if you need it to be bigger or smaller, you need to stick to about the same ratio of mandrel size in order for the clasp to work out. When I'm making a clasp and I only need to make one ring, I like to conserve as much of my wire as possible. So I'm going to demonstrate how to make just one ring on the very end, but make sure to leave enough overlap in the curve of your circle to end up with a fully curved ring. The dry erase marker, if we take a quick look at this, you can see that it tapers slightly and it gets a little bit finer towards the end that writes. The 18 millimeter part of this mandrel is going to be the larger end, so you want to make sure to wrap at the end of this. I'm going to hold my mandrel in my non-dominant hand with the cap side inside of my hand, and I'm going to place the wire right on the front side and then draw it tightly down and around. And instead of keeping going and wrapping the rest of my wire, I'm going to stop right there, but I'm going to press this tail down as much as I can. So when I take this off of the mandrel, you can see I have a segment of wire here that's fully curved and a segment of wire on this side that's fully curved. So I will actually be able to get a full jump ring from this small coil. I'm going to be working with my Lindstrom cutters because they are going to be a little bit sturdier than the razor flush cutters. I don't really recommend using the razor flush cutters on 12 gauge wire. It's really hard to get through in one cut, so you have to kind of go chomp, chomp, chomp to get through your wire, which is probably not so great for your cutters and also not going to produce a very good flush cut. So I'm going to look at my wire and I've got this straight piece that wouldn't quite get pushed down into a curve and then it starts to curve into a circle. So I'm going to line up my cutters with the flat side facing away from the tail so I've got my flush cut oriented in the correct space. And before I cut, what I'm looking for is a nice sharp 90 degree angle between the wire and the flat side of the cutter. Once I see that, I can squeeze and cut. The tail should fall loose and I'm left with a flush cut. In order to keep cutting and have my flush cut be in the right place, I'm going to flip my cutters over and now I'm going to line them up on the other side right about where I cut the first one without recutting it. Only now, because I flipped my cutters over, I'm looking on the other side for my 90 degree angle. So I was looking underneath before, I'll be looking on top this time. When I squeeze it closed, the ring should fall loose and what's left here is two perfectly flush cuts. Now you would want to form your smaller ring on the Sharpie mandrel using the exact same steps we just walked through. 
Once you have created both of the rings for this clasp, we have to close them up so that they will fuse closed. If you are a glutton for punishment like me, you can feel free to use your fingers to manipulate and close these rings. When I'm working with a larger size jump ring such as these, I kind of like to use my fingers because I feel I have a little bit more control. If you did want to save some wear and tear on your fingers, you would probably want to use your two pairs of pliers and grab the sides of your ring to maneuver them closed. But like I said, I kind of like to use my hands. So the first thing I'm going to do to this jump ring is I'm going to overlap the two sides just a little bit. By forcing this overlap, what you're actually doing is putting pressure from the two sides of the joint on it to help keep it extra closed. So then I can pull this open slightly and it will go click and it closes up. And now I have a perfectly closed flush cut jump ring. And then I will repeat the same step for my sharpie sized ring, forcing my overlap and then pulling it closed. Now that your rings are perfectly closed, you can go ahead and fuse them. Now that I have made sure that my jump rings are fully closed, I'm going to fuse them with my torch. When you're working with really heavy gauges of wire, it's important that you make sure that you get the rings hot enough to get a full fuse all the way through to the core of the wire. If you don't get enough heat, what will happen is you'll get a surface fuse. It'll look like it's fused, but then when you go to do any shaping or manipulating or hammering or anything like that, the seam will actually pop open, which is kind of a pain. So I'm going to quickly light my torch and working just beyond the bright blue cone, I'm going to really, really evenly distribute the heat around this ring. And you can see I'm moving rapidly, but not so rapidly that I can't control what I'm doing. Starting to see a semi-matte finish on the metal. And what I'm looking for is slick and shiny. When I see slick and shiny, I'm going to wiggle on the joint until it closes. Then I'm going to move on to the larger ring. One thing to keep in mind about working with this heavy gauge of wire, and especially a larger ring like this one I have here, is that it's gonna take a minute. So don't feel like you're, you're rushing it. Make sure that you're patient. It will fuse. Starting to see my semi-matte finish. And I'm looking for slick and shiny, and then I will wiggle on the joint until I see it close up. Slick and shiny, so I'm going to wiggle until it closes up. Since my rings are fully fused now, I'm going to drop them in my quenching bowl, and then we'll be ready to shape and hammer. After I took this ring and threw it in the water, I turned it over to look at the back side just to make sure that I had fully fused the seam. And if you look right here where the seam is, I can still see a visible seam. And when I run my fingernail across it, I can still feel that seam as well, which makes me a little bit anxious that this ring might not be fully fused all the way to the center. So I'm going to relight my torch and smooth out that seam just to make sure that it's a nice full fuse. Since I have quenched the metal, I will have to start by reheating the entire ring and really, really evenly distributing the heat. going to go through about the same steps that we saw before. The metal will start to look brushed finish and glow faintly orange. And then right when it's ready to go, it's going to look slick and shiny again. So I will wiggle on the joint until it's closed. Almost there. Slick and shiny. So just like that, I got that seam to smooth out. So you will want to make sure to inspect both sides of your rings to make sure it is fully, fully fused. The first thing that we're going to do is shape the hook portion of the clasp right now while the metal is nice and soft from being heated up. So I'm going to work only with the large ring at this point and I'm going to use my small mandrel to actually shape the large side of the clasp so that it ends up looking like the smaller side of the clasp. 
This requires a little bit of hand strength, so I a lot of times will recommend to my students if you have trouble manipulating the wire, getting a hand strengthener, and while you're watching TV, sitting there and squeezing it to improve your hand strength. I'm going to start by placing my ring on the Sharpie and using my fingers, I'm going to squeeze it until it is an oval shape. And I'm making sure to keep one side of the ring firmly pushed against the Sharpie. So when I take this off here, kind of looks like a racetrack. Now that I have made my racetrack shape, I'm going to go ahead and make this part a little bit narrower so that it will become the hook portion of the clasp. I'm going to use my chain nose pliers and I'm going to open them very wide and grab the two sides and start to draw them in towards each other. Again, making sure that this side of the ring is fully against the Sharpie so it's maintaining its shape. I'm going to continue pulling this in until it's not quite touching but it's pretty close and then I'm going to squeeze all the way towards the Sharpie drawing the two sides together so that what I end up with when I take this off of my Sharpie looks like a bowling pin or a light bulb depending on what your eye sees. Once you have shaped the hook side of your clasp, we can go ahead and hammer these. So the small ring I'm going to place on my bench block, and I'm just going to hammer this one flat. I'm not going to do any shaping to it. You will want to make sure to hammer this ring pretty flat because the hole size that we're going to be using is 1.6 millimeters. The metal has to be fairly wide in order for the hole to fit in the metal without being weak. Okay, that looks pretty flat to me. So now I'm going to turn my hammer over and using the ball end, I'm going to start putting some texture in the metal. Got my thumb resting here just to hold on to the ring because it tends to go flying across the room. You will want to make sure not to hit your thumb with the hammer because it hurts. And I'm going to turn it around and get the other side. And I think that looks pretty good. So I'm going to move on to the hook portion of the clasp. Because we are going to be taking this hook and bending it over, if we just hammered and textured all on one side of this portion of the clasp, once we bent it into its hook shape, the hammered part would not be in the right place. So I'm going to start by hammering the entire thing flat. making sure to keep my fingers out of the way. Okay, and a lot of times I will actually take my other part portion of my clasp and compare how thick the metal is so that they'll look really symmetrical when I'm done. I think I can go a little bit flatter on this side of the clasp. Okay, now I've got it flattened, so for putting texture in, I'm going to flip my hammer over, and what I'm going to do now is I'm only going to texture the skinny end of the hook portion of the clasp. I'm not going to hit the large end at all, just the small end, so I kind of keep my finger over it to help myself remember. I'm going to hammer right to where the two sides start to widen back out into a circle. <clears throat> And then I'm actually going to flip this over and now I'm only going to hammer the large portion of this clasp. And the reason that I do it this way is if you try to texture on both sides of the metal when you're hammering on a steel block, it's going to smooth out any hammering you did on the other side. So this will help us make sure that our hammering is in the correct place when we bend our clasp.
And I'm just hammering right to where the two pieces taper together. So once I'm finished, I have textured on the large side, and then if I flip it over, texture on the small side. Now that I have textured and everything is ready to go with my clasp, I'm going to go ahead and punch my holes before I bend the hook portion into the hook portion of the clasp. And I'm actually going to use my friend Sharpie as a marking utensil. I like to use this clasp a lot of times for a three strand bracelet. So I'm actually going to take my Sharpie and I'm going to mark three spots on the metal that are hopefully equidistant from each other so that I have a visual guide where to place my holes. And then I actually take the other side of the clasp and mirror image my Sharpie marks on the metal so that hopefully the two sides of my clasp will have symmetrical holes. That one got a little messy, so I'm just gonna retouch. Okay. Now that I have marked where to place my three holes, I'm going to use my two hole punch. I'm going to be working with the smaller of the two bits. Again, this is a 1.6 millimeter hole. And this hole punch works pretty simply. All you have to do is place your metal underneath the bit and then screw down on the bit until it punches through the metal. A lot of times people tend to break this tool because they're not careful when they're removing their metal from it. So after you've punched your hole, you will want to just back the bit out until the metal actually falls off. You don't ever want to grab the metal and pull it off of there while the bit is unsupported because you're more likely to break it. The first couple times you work with this particular tool, it might feel a little bit like you're wrestling with an octopus, but it does get easier to handle the more you do it. I'm going to start with my first hole. And what I do is I line it up right on the Sharpie mark and I screw the bit down so it's actually holding on to the metal, it's not going to fall out. And before I punch this hole, I take a look at it. Is it equidistant between the two sides of the metal and centered perfectly? If it is not, now is the time to make any adjustments. Once you have centered your metal and you're sure that you're punching the hole in the right place, you can go ahead and screw down on the punch until you feel the pressure release, which means you've punched through the metal and then back the bit back out until the piece actually falls off. And I've made my first hole. Now I have punched all of the holes in both sides of my clasp, so it's time to turn the hook portion into a hook. If I were to take this metal that we just hammered the crap out of and bend it into a hook right now, since we hammered it, we have stiffened up the metal quite a bit. So what would probably happen is on the edge of the hook, you would see little tiny fractures from metal fatigue because we're trying to bend such hardened metal. So we actually need to take this and soften it up before we try to do any bending or manipulating to it. To soften up or anneal the metal, I'm actually going to place the hook portion of the clasp on my fire brick and light my torch. And I'm going to heat this up so that it is glowing orange, but I don't actually want to get it hot enough to melt. So I'm just going to go around the perimeter of the ring. And again, what I'm looking for is a dull orange glow or the matte finish will do as well. You just want to make sure to get it good and warm without melting the metal. Okay. And it looks like I've got a pretty healthy glow. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off my torch, grab it with my tweezers and toss it in my water. And now the metal should be softened up so we can go ahead and manipulate this into a hook. To shape this hook into a hook, I'm going to use my two pairs of chain nose pliers. And I like to grab with the hammered side on the large end facing towards me. I'm going to grab right where the two pieces start to taper together. You will want to be cautious because we just softened this metal up not to grip too tightly with your pliers or you'll leave large marks in the metal, which we don't really want. 
So I'm going to take my second pair of pliers and I'm actually going to grab out on the hook. If you grab right next to your pliers, that's not going to make a very great hook. If you grab all the way at the end, you're going to end up with your bend in a weird spot. So I'm going to grab about midway on the pliers and I actually think it's a little bit more comfortable to come from the top because my wrist will actually move in the correct direction. Once I've grabbed, I'm going to roll the hook over until it starts to have a bend in it and then I actually switch to my fingers leaving my pliers there to hold the base of the clasp sturdy just to push this down until it is angled slightly in towards the center you can see it kind of tapers down that will make this clasp a lot more secure before you say that you're finished shaping this portion however you'll want to take the eye portion and make sure that it feels like a nice secure clasp you can do any little bit of adjustments push down slightly or pull up slightly on the hook until it fits perfectly now that you have shaped this clasp, you'll probably want to throw it in the tumbler for 20 to 30 minutes, especially because we softened up the hook portion. Moving on to the textured toggle, I'm going to be using two different mandrels. The first is the dry erase marker that we used for the hook and eye clasp, and also the small stepped mandrel. And the tier that I'm going to be working on is going to be this one right in the center. The wire gauge that we're using is 14 gauge wire, so I've also brought out my Tronex razor flush cutters. Since we stepped down a gauge in wire, these cutters can now handle the gauge of wire that we're going to be cutting and will make a better flush cut. When I am making rings on the small mandrel, especially in a heavy gauge wire, it gets a little bit tricky because the wire is so heavy. So I'm going to start by leaving myself a good tail to hold on to and bring it tightly down and around the mandrel. I'm gonna end up with a little bit more waste just because the wire is kind of hard to wrangle when it is this heavy on this small of a mandrel. I want to end up with two complete jump rings. So once I have made my small coil, this one on the end is not even perfectly round because it was hard to hold onto the wire and wrap it around. So that's gonna end up being a little bit of waste. So I'm gonna start cutting on the other end of the coil. I'm going to take my cutters and line them up with the flat side in the correct position, looking for my really sharp 90 degree angle. And then once I see that, I can cut and the wire should fall off. And I'm left with a perfectly flush cut. Then I can flip my cutters over. I'm going to come in and line it up nice and straight, looking for my nice sharp right angle between the wire and the flat side of the cutter and cut the ring loose. Because this is such a small diameter ring, it's going to be really tricky to close. We'll move on to that in just a moment. To continue cutting, I'm going to flip my cutters back into the original position. I'm going to just trim off that last little ugly bit. Again, looking for my nice sharp 90 degree angle. You can go ahead and cut just that little bit off and then flip my cutters over to cut this next ring loose. To make the toggle portion, I'm going to switch to my dry erase marker and again we're remembering that this end is smaller than the, the farther end away from where the marker writes. So I'm again going to make my loop on this end by holding with my thumb, and bringing the wire down and around, making sure to get a nice fully curved overlap circle. Then I can go ahead and cut this ring as well, making sure to be very precise with my cuts. Flip my cutters over. So now I have my three rings. And for closing these small ones up, I'm again going to bring in my two pairs of chain nose pliers. Closing the small rings is going to be a little bit different than closing the larger ones because you can't really force the overlap without really misshaping these rings. I'm going to take my two pairs of pliers. I'm going to start wiggling the two sides of this jump ring towards each other until I can feel them scraping up against each other because then I know it's really, really closed. Taking a look at it from all directions to make sure the wire is perfectly lined up. If you have any sort of 
difference in height on the two sides of the ring. You can always take your pliers and squeeze gently on the top of the seam to bring them closer together. But you do want to make sure that this ring is as closed as it can be. Now I have completely closed all of my jump rings, so I'm going to take them and place them on my fire brick and fuse them all closed before I worry about turning them into a toggle. Now I'm ready to fuse, so I'm going to light my torch and get ready to fuse these. The reason that I am fusing these closed before I join them together is it is a heck of a lot easier to try and join shapes together when you don't have to worry about an open seam. So I set myself up to do pretty well by fusing them first. On the small rings, you want to be careful not to overcook them or they will just kind of melt into oblivion. So, just going to start heating them up. And I'm looking for that slick and shiny. Once I see that, I'm going to get that joint to close up and get out of there. Happens really quick on a small diameter ring, so be careful. Moving on to the next ring, I've got my matte finish. I'm looking for slick and shiny. When I see that, I'm just going to pull up slightly and wiggle on that joint till I see it flow closed. And now I can move on to the big ring. The big ring will take a little bit longer because it's a lot larger in diameter. So we're just really evenly going to distribute the heat around the ring. And I've got my brushed finish and it's glowing faintly orange. Just looking for slick and shiny so I can wiggle on the joint and close it up. There it is. Wiggle on that joint. Now that the rings are fused, I'm going to go ahead and quench them and we'll be ready to move on. All of my rings are fused now, so I'm ready to create the toggle bar and then fuse this into a toggle. If we take a look at this toggle, if you've worn a toggle clasp before that's fallen off, chances are it's because the bar is not actually long enough for the clasp to stay securely fastened. This ring has to be able to rock all the way from one side of the toggle to the other at the widest point without the bar slipping through the toggle or it will not be a secure clasp. As you can see, this one fits perfectly so it would be pretty hard for this toggle to fall off. I'm still going to be working with my 14 gauge wire and I'm actually going to straighten this wire out as much as I can so it's less work for myself later. And then using my razor flush cutters, I'm just going to trim the end of this wire so that I have a nice flat cut to start with so my wire is nice and flush. When I am sizing the bar for a toggle, my general rule of thumb is I go one and then a half of the toggle all the way across the widest point and that should be long enough. So once you have measured that you can go ahead and cut. Again you will want to make sure that you've left a nice flush cut on your toggle bar and then we should be ready to assemble these pieces. If we take a look at these two circles sitting next to each other. What we have right now are two fully curved surfaces and the only point that they're making contact is the center of that curve. So the odds of this turning out right now are pretty slim. I've got a little trick to help make this a little bit more successful on a more consistent basis. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my chain nose pliers and I'm just going to grab on the side of my ring and I'm going to squeeze with my pliers so I'm leaving a flat spot. In order to make this toggle fully successful, I'm also going to take the small ring and repeat the same step by grabbing with my chain nose pliers and squeezing to make a flat spot. So when I line the flat spots up together, what I now have are two completely flat surfaces touching, which gives this toggle a lot higher chance of success for actually fusing together. You will need to repeat these same steps in the center of your toggle bar and also on the other small circle. I have placed 
both pieces of my toggle on my fire brick, making sure to line up the flat spots that I made on both circle right next to each other. If I were to go ahead and try to fuse this, it would probably work some of the time, but not all of the time. So I have one more little trick to make this a more successful experience. I'm going to take my 20 gauge wire and I'm just going to cut a small piece that is about the length of my seam. And then using my tweezers, I can take this small piece of wire and actually place it right on the seam which will help bridge the gap between these two pieces. The small wire, since it's 20 gauge, is going to melt first and actually force contact between these two pieces, making the fusing experience a lot more successful. Now I'm going to light my torch. Since we're fusing two shapes together and one is a lot larger than the other one, you have to keep in mind that that small circle is going to heat up a lot faster. So we want to kind of work on just heating up the large portion of this toggle first. The, the smaller piece is actually going to get heat reflected off of the large one without me pointing my torch directly at it. So I'm just going to start by working in a circular motion just on the large portion of the toggle. And as we go along here, what we're going to see is it's going to start to look brushed or matte finish again. That means it's getting pretty warm. So at this point, when I get warmed up on the large circle, I'm going to start working in a figure eight. And then maybe go on the small one a couple of times. We really ideally want to have both pieces of this toggle heated up. Now I'm getting to the point where my metal is starting to move around and become molten, so I'm going to do what I call my bounce bounce technique. I'm going to start by superheating the seam till I see the metal start to flow, and then I'm going to pull back for a second just to see how far the metal is going to flow before I try to fuse any further. A lot of times what tends to happen when you're fusing a large shape and a small shape together is the small shape will try to just pull into the large shape and disappear, which is what we're trying to fight here. So I've got my piece of wire completely melted in, looks like a good solid fuse. Before I quench it, I'm actually going to flip it over and take a look at the back side. This looks like a nice join to me as well, so I'm going to say that this toggle is fully fused. If you could still clearly see the seam between these two rings, you would probably want to go ahead and heat the whole thing up and smooth it out just a little bit. When you are making the bar for your toggle, this piece is actually a little bit trickier than making the toggle because we've got a long skinny piece of wire and then a small circle. Where this tends to fail when it gets too hot is it pulls really thin on either side of the circle on the bar. So you want to fight really hard to keep from overheating that bar portion of the toggle. I've got my two flat edges lined up and a small piece of 20 gauge placed on the seam just to help bridge the gap and make our fusing experience more successful. I'm going to go ahead and light my torch. I'm going to start by just heating the toggle bar. Since that's the larger surface area, it's going to take a little bit longer to get heated up. And then once I've heated that toggle bar up and I can see it glowing faintly, I'm going to start working on the circle too. Then back on the bar and on the circle and back on the bar and on the circle. Got my wire kind of moving around. So I'm going to start heating up the seam and then getting out of there till I see how far it's going to flow so that I don't accidentally cook this toggle bar into oblivion. Uh, it looks like a pretty good solid fuse to me. So before I quench it, again, I'm going to grab it with my tweezers and flip it over to take a look at the back side. This also looks like a really good join. Again, if you could very clearly see the seam between the two pieces, you would want to heat this up and get it to fuse before you quench. Since my toggle is all fused, I'm ready to hammer and texture. One thing to keep in mind when you are hammering and texturing is if you take this hammer and pound like crazy on that seam, it is possible that you could pop it back open. So you want to have a little bit of a delicate touch, especially when you're he hammering on the seam you just fused. Just going to hammer flat. all the way around the toggle. And once I flatten the metal, I'm now ready to flip my hammer over and using the ball end, put in some texture.
pretty good. So I'm going to move on to the bar end. And again, making sure you keep your fingers out of the way. I know I've got my fingers right in the action here, but it really does hurt when you hit it with your hammer, so use caution. Now that I've flattened, I can flip my hammer over and put in some texture. One thing I want to point out about this toggle bar at this point is these edges, remember we left a nice razor flush cut on either end of this toggle bar, but as I hammered, it kind of made them sharp. So if I were to wear this right now, it would probably hurt a lot and it would dig into your skin and everything else. So you'll probably want to take a small metal file and just kind of soften the corners of your toggle bar so that it's a little bit more comfortable to wear. To create the smooth toggle with the bald ends on the toggle bar, I've used my friend Sharpie as my large mandrel, and on the stepped mandrel, I've actually used the second tier, the next to smallest one, to create my two small circles. Much like the last toggle, I flush cut all of them and close them well, and now I'm going to take them and fuse them all independently of each other, just like we did in the last toggle. The toggle bar, however, since we're going to be balling the ends, it's a little bit different for sizing. You'll want to do about twice the diameter of your toggle as opposed to one and a half times since we will be losing a little bit of length when we create the balls. To create the balls on 14 gauge wire, we're going to have to use our fire brick because the heat from the torch alone is not enough to ball this really heavy gauge of wire. But if we think about this, if I were to just lay this flat and try to create a ball, because the wire is sitting on a flat surface, it would have a flat spot, which is not exactly what we want. We want fully rounded balls on the end of our wire. So I'm going to take my chain nose pliers and grasp right just shy of the middle of the wire, and I'm going to bend this wire into an L shape, just a little bit wider than exactly 90 degrees. And then I'm going to take this and hang it right over the side of my brick. So now I have my wire hanging precariously on the edge of my brick. It's really important when you go to fuse this that you are set up so should this wire flip off the brick or if the ball gets too heavy and drips off of the end of the wire, there is a stainless steel work surface underneath and not your lap because that would hurt really badly. I'm going to go ahead and light my torch and dim the lights here in our studio. I'm going to start from coming just below my wire and heating up the length of the wire slightly. It wiggles around a little bit, but it'll stay in place in a minute. So once I've warmed up the wire, I'm just going to hold my torch right at the bottom. And the heat reflecting off the brick is actually enough to make it start to ball, which it has started to do. Once it starts to ball, I'm going to gently push it upwards till I get a ball about the size that I want, which is totally an aesthetic thing and up to you. Now I've made the ball on one side, so I'm going to grasp the wire with my tweezers and I'm going to flip it over so I can now put a ball on the other end. And again, heating from the bottom up, just gently warming up the wire and then coming from just below till a ball forms and then gently pushing upwards. Now at this point you want to try to keep your eye on the other end so that you end up making two symmetrical balls so one side is not larger than the other. Now that I've formed the ball on either end I can take this and toss it in my quenching bowl and pull it back out and I have an L-shaped kind of L-shaped piece of wire. So I would want to go ahead and straighten out the toggle bar at this point and I'm going to take my chain nose pliers and gently, very gently squeeze to straighten the wire out as much as possible. 
From here, you would repeat the exact same steps as the previous toggle to fuse your toggle and your toggle bar. Now that I have formed both of my toggles, I'm going to have to put these through the tumbler just to strengthen them up. Since we did hammer this toggle, it would need to tumble for very long, maybe 15 minutes or so, just to shine it up and make it nice and pretty again. The smooth toggle, because we didn't do anything to harden up this wire, will need to tumble for 30 to 40 minutes just to make sure that it's strong enough to be worn as a toggle. If you are planning on fusing these onto a chain, you would want to do that before you toss them into the tumbler. Thanks so much for joining me for class today. And don't forget if you have any questions, you can feel free to send us an email here at beeducation.com. Have fun fusing.